Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. I'm very excited to evangelize uh, my product and my company, and I appreciate everybody uh, coming here today to listen to what we have to say. Uh, well, let me start off. Uh, as Jim said, uh, one of the most exciting things I just got off with is I'm the patent holder and vendor of the motion controller that was licensed to Nintendo to make the Wii. And what I'm most proud of uh, of that venture is the fact that um, innovation uh, is clearly a winner in today's market as it was in 2001. Now, let me bring you back to 2001 very quickly. Uh, uh, we had Microsoft with the uh, Xbox, clearly a dominating player, and Sony's PlayStation, a dominant player, and everybody had kind of left Nintendo off as a distant third or a dying company. And uh, a guy like myself walked into uh, Kyoto, J uh, Japan with the technology that after had visiting Microsoft and Sony and offering it to them, and, and, and they passed on it, saying it, they just didn't get it. Uh, within 30 minutes, uh, this Nintendo company, the chairman, Asada, uh, understood it, embraced it, ran with it, and today uh, they are, I'm very excited about it, they are the largest company now in Japan. So you can see how innovation changes uh, the way we live, and it changes the world, and it changes companies. So with that kind of attitude, I think this is what the world needs now, innovation. I don't believe we can get out of the situation we're in unless the right innovation uh, comes to be, and the United States is the leader in innovation. Uh, we depend upon it. Uh, it's our lifestyle of being able to grow and profit from it. So uh, it's very encouraging to stand up on stage like this today and kind of give this kind of presentation to show you what my next venture is all about. Uh, after launching uh, the motion controller, uh, I came across this three years ago, which is the IEA reports, the International Energy Association. It's the most widely watched uh, uh, report that determines from crude oil to uh, uh, natural gas and the planet. And there are different modes of, of monitoring this because only the United States and the United Kingdom actually reports the production of their fuels. Everybody else lies about it. So uh, what you see here is what we've already been experiencing. And I saw this uh, three years ago and I said, wow, I mean, we're heading for a catastrophe. And as Stephen Wu, uh, who's now the head of uh, the Obama's uh, administration on energy said, he said uh, three years ago in his book that if we don't fix this problem uh, in three years, which is now two years, we're really headed for some catastrophes uh, in the world. And so, you know, not to be on the negative side of this whole thing, but there is a rush. Uh, we've only deployed energy and the uses of, that we have today for the last 75 years. Um, my father is about that age, so everybody seems to have this uh, impression that it's always been this way, and it hasn't. So to perceive that the next 75 years will be like it is today is greatly exaggerated or mistaken from anybody who's taking that position. But this chart shows you uh, we haven't run out of oil or natural gas. We've run out of cheap oil and natural gas. We're no longer drilling straight down to get our oil into a, a well. We're drilling sideways, horizontal drilling. That means we're going after the veins. We're not going after the center of the supply. And we're pumping seawater and everything else into it. So it's a very real situation that we face as a as a nation, people, and the world. And uh, this is where I got me thinking that I need to come uh, into this uh, market and I need to think about how we're going to solve this problem. So I established uh, you know, a top team. Uh, what I felt and I learned was that uh, a gallon of liquid fuel, uh, if we don't replace that, uh, there'll be no way to solve the energy crisis that we're in right now because the fact that one gallon of liquid fuel has 80 times the energy content that's found in equivalent size lithium battery that's generated for electricity. Electricity is the most convenient energy source on the planet, but the most inefficient because it cannot be stored. So if you, you know, once you commit, and almost 90% of the world uses fossil fuel to obtain its electricity, once you commit to taking something that can be stored for millions of years, converting that into electricity, it's now a depleting source of energy. So it's very difficult. So uh, my mission uh, went towards the fact that let's solve uh, a replacement for liquid fuel. And one of the things that I, I learned was uh, Silicon Valley is great on what we call paradigm shifts. 
uh, Steve Jobs and uh, Gary Wozniak, uh, they're not known for inventing the micro, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, microprocessor. They're known for consumerizing the personal computer. And what that meant was, back in those days, if you remember, uh, we all relied on IBM digital equipment for processing time. We had our ASCII terminals, and if you were lucky and someone would allow you to do it and you paid enough money, you were able to share that one processor. Well, what they did was they said, you know what, we're going to put in the hands of all consumers uh, the ability to have their own personal computing power. And from that point, that started a movement. And uh, at the beginning, the industry looks at it as a kind of a, a, a toy, a novelty thing, oh, that's kind of cute and what have you. But as we all know today, it's quite different. Uh, once you put uh, the power of the people to do what industry once did, is creates the paradigm shift. And Silicon Valley, nobody in the world does that better than us. And you can count the number of major industries that have fallen because of a disruptive technology that was created right here um, in the area that we live. So with doing that, uh, we have mented, uh, invented what we call the microfeeler. I could perceive this, or you should perceive this as the Apple II computer. Uh, what it does is it allows people. See, and, and what happened was, uh, what learning about this, let me set the stage here. And uh, uh, at the end of the uh, uh, 70s, we had an oil embargo. And during that time, President uh, Jimmy Carter, along with Congress, uh, as a national security issue, passed a law that said every American property, uh, uh, property owner has the right to produce up to 10,000 gallons of distilled fuel uh, as a national security because at, back then it was 20% of our reliance on fuel. Now it's close to 60%. So you can imagine if we were to be cut off, which is not a scenario that's not unlikely right now, there would be catastrophic uh, problems across the United States, if not the world. So this law is in effect uh, for distilled. It's not for biodiesel, but it's for uh, distilled uh, ethanol products. And the other th interesting thing is that uh, when we got rid of lead back in uh, uh, the late 80s, uh, about 87, in our fuel system, uh, we replaced it with ethanol. And the law went out from the United States saying that all cars must be compatible with ethanol uh, because that's the re fuel replacement. So everybody in this room drives in the United States and most of the world with a mixture of, of uh, petrol, gasoline, and ethanol as a supplement in their fuel. And the things you probably don't even know is that as you go to get the more expensive Supreme gasoline, you're getting more ethanol because ethanol increases your octane.